member of the Pokecasters Network. Pokecasters Network, supporting Pokemon content creators, their shows, and the community of Pokemon fans. To find out more, check out pokecastersnetwork.com or find us on Twitter and Facebook. Hello, and welcome to Lucas Lectures, hosted by the big fish himself, veteran Lucas. Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's topic. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Lucas Lecture. This is me, Veteran Lucas. Hope you guys are having a fantastic December. I am currently out here in Hamamatsu, Japan, and I gotta say, it's cold. Uh, okay, by, by cold, I mean it's like 50 to 40 degrees outside. I know some people are like, that's not cold. I'm a Florida boy. It's getting colder. The fall is going away, and I'm really, really sad. But luckily, I have enough layers to survive. But as I record these, I have to turn off my heater because the sound of the fan gets into the recording. So uh, let's keep this going as quickly as possible. Now, if you saw our Twitter post on around Wednesday or Thursday, I forget how time differences work anyway, uh, we are actually going to be talking about space. Uh, specifically, there are multiple Pokemon that seem to have come from space. And the entire topic of what these things are related to, uh, what these things would mean to the planet's ecosystem, that's all well and good. But I want to talk about where they came from. The other stuff can fill an entire episode, and I just want to talk a little bit about where these Pokemon came from. Where is their origin planet? What on earth is going on that all these Pokemon are ending up landing on our home? Uh, a couple things to note. Life probably exists out in our world, in our universe. Anyone who thinks that we are the only ones in the universe, to me, that's just selfish. Now, have aliens invaded the planet, and have they been hiding among us, or have they been watching us, or probing us, or any of that stuff? I don't believe so. I don't. I really don't. Personally, I haven't seen any concrete evidence to prove that fact, and I will not believe it. I'm not going to believe hearsay and wild stories, especially since the last time we talked about aliens, we were able to prove that Alien sightings don't happen where there's the highest population to see them. It happens where the people have the highest culture of seeing them. So really, anyone say, seen a UFO, I'm sorry, I haven't seen one. I haven't seen any good video of them. I'm sorry if that ruins your stuff. Please stop attacking Area 51. They can kill you. Not even joking. You try running on there, they have the right to shoot you. Don't do that. Don't try that again. So how would life even get here. Let's say life, we always think of it as like a spaceship coming down or like being warped down Star Trek style. But life had to have started somewhere in the universe aside from here. And there's proof to show that you can get life from one planet to travel to the other without a rocket ship, without any sort of technology. Now, this theory is called panspermia. So panspermia is the theory of how life can travel between planets. So the first thing you have to think about is, wait, how would that even get off the planet to begin with? And all I ask is that you look up at the night sky and look at our moon. Our moon was created by an impact on the planet billions of years ago that knocked a chunk of the Earth into orbit, and then it started to rotate around creating the moon. The same thing can happen to other planets, specifically Mars. Mars had some form of impact or other, and we have found on our own planet chunks of rock and mineral from Mars. Like, we were able to prove it's from Mars, so we can prove to you guys that you can get a rock to move from one place to the other across planet. It may take millions of years, if not billions of years, to get there. But with space being a vacuum, once it launches, it's just going to go whatever direction it ends up in. And with Mars being technically so close to us, it has a higher chance of that happening. The other thing you have to worry about is how is it going to survive the exiting of the atmosphere, flying through space, and the impact of that thing hitting our planet. And the answer is actually really cool. Back about almost 20 years ago, there was a study to see if bacteria could survive at a hypervelocity impact. As in, if you fired off bacteria and hunks of rock to see if it would actually survive the journey and the impact. And long story short, it did. 
the velocity that they were able to fire it at was similar to that of an object both leaving Mars and entering Earth's atmosphere. So all you would need is a organism to be able to survive the incredible speed of leaving, the longevity of staying in space where it's cold without oxygen, and then, of course, surviving the impact. So we have a couple of Pokemon to look at, and from there, we can judge exactly what kind of planet they were living on. So let's look at uh, the first one, Deoxys. Okay, Deoxys, we're not going to be able to use that much, because Deoxys was a virus that mutated when it was exposed to Earth. We have no idea what it actually looked like, but we can prove that the virus survived something, and we can get into more details on that in a future episode. Uh, next up, Lunatone and Solrock. So Lunatone was found on a meteor crash site, and it seems to get its energy from the moon. And can I just make a tangent here and just say that getting energy from the moon versus the sun is kind of dumb? Where do you think the light of the moon comes from? Like I said, it's a hunk of rock in the sky from Earth, so it's not exactly filled with glow worms or cheese. Believe it or not, it's just the sun reflecting off onto the moon. Vampires should have no reason to be saying, ah, I'm out of the sunlight. Y yes, but the moon is technically sunlight, too. And then they just vaporize in a puff of logic and ash. Incidentally, if you have something that's feeding off the moon and living like that, it could be seen as nocturnal. It could be as an animal or an organism that needs a nighttime and a daytime cycle. Uh, incidentally, it also can put people to sleep, which is just kind of weird. Soul rock feeds on sunlight, and it can use that sunlight to blind things and then also keep itself operating. So that says that it probably there is some kind of sun wherever they are. Now we get to two of the legendaries that scare the crap out of me. Uh, that's Externius. Externius from uh, Galar is honestly a little forgettable and story-wise. I mean, it just kind of pops up. I didn't really care. But, but then when you see it get absolutely massive and terrifying, you're like, oh, oh, that's not good. So this Pokemon's ability is to feed off energy. And it becomes this massive monstrosity. And apparently with energy only taken from a single country, it can generate enough power to rip holes in the fabric of reality. That's pretty nuts. Uh, next, we also have Kiram. Kiram is thought to have come from a meteor, but that's still debated. Uh, they're still using, they're debating whether it was a meteor, if it was already here. The lore is weird. Um, but we do know that it can survive the harshness of space pretty easily because of how cold it is. And one final entry, one last one I was going to add right at the end here, uh, Starmie and Staryu. So Starmie and Staryu are sending off radio signals constantly. There's thoughts that they came from another planet too, and that they're signaling something or someone. Yeah, we'll get to that another time. So what would this world be like? Let's assume that all of these Pokemon come from the exact same planet. So, the world they're living in is going to have a sun. It's going to have some kind of sun or star fueling it. Maybe it's the same star as us. Maybe it's further out in the farthest deep regions of space. I think it would be a Mars or Venus situation where it's going to be a little bit closer to us because that means that an impact that was made on that planet can now shoot off rock, mineral, and Pokemon into space and have a higher chance of hitting us. Uh, second, we know that with the sun, it's going to have water. Starmie and Staryu would prove that. If they come from all come to the same planet, they are going to need some kind of water to survive in. Now, that also puts us in the sweet spot, what some people refer to as the Goldilocks position. If you are a certain distance from the sun, it's um, too cold. If you're a little too close, it's too hot. But then you have where Earth is, the Goldilocks range, where it's just right to sustain life. Now, a planet doesn't need to be in this if the, we're following the Pokemon's rules. None of the Pokemon I've mentioned really need oxygen, but they all need water. Every single living thing on the planet follows that rule in our world, so I assume that it follows theirs. So in order to have water, you are going to need to be in that Goldilocks region where it's not so hot that it vaporizes, and not so cold that it's just ice. Something else that I think is really interesting is if you look at Lunatone and Solrock, both of these Pokemon have defense mechanisms. 
both of these Pokemon are going to have some way to defend themselves from something attacking them. Consider this. Both of them are Rock and Psychic type. They wouldn't really need to go after each other. And also, they are going to be in different time zones and different times of the day. They are going to be more Lunatones active when it's dark out. There's going to be more Soul Rocks around whenever there is sunlight. Meaning that something else is hunting them on that planet. So there are other alien Pokemon out there that were hunting these things. Why else would a Lunatone have the ability to put things to sleep? And why else would a Soul Rock have the ability to absorb sunlight and use it to blind something? Those are evolutionary defense tactics. Now, if you get to the legendaries, Externius tells us a lot. Uh, Externius shows that this thing can absorb an obscene amount of energy and turn that obscene amount of energy into an ungodly amount of energy. What I find so weird about this is that with something like Asternius, it's able to absorb so much energy, it probably is going to find itself surviving in some place on the sunnier sides of the planet. I think this is a Pokemon that lives in a sunny area, but doesn't have access to any more energy than that sun is providing. I mean, if you think about it, it could also be that it's a little bit further from the sun than our Pokemon Earth is, because this Pokemon is again, capable of absorbing a little bit of energy and turning it into a lot, if this thing made its way from a planet with little to no excess energy and then found its way to Earth, where there's tons of places to get more energy, or the sun is a lot closer to absorb more energy, that would make a lot of sense. That's probably why the reality hasn't been ripped apart yet. There could be a planet of externitus just floating out there, unable to move around unless they get the energy. We have a similar animal on Earth, the tardigrade. Tardigrades, and they don't have the energy, they just freeze up. When you put them in a cold area, tardigrades will just freeze over, and then you put a little water on them and it's good. Externius is probably from a planet very similar, where it's super inactive, doesn't move, and then it gets enough energy, it can move around and start hunting. Kiram is a little bit different. Again, it's debated whether it's from the planet or not. But what's really fun about Kiram is that it's an ice dragon, meaning that if you were to somehow get launched into space, it's cold. It doesn't care. All of the Pokemon I mentioned don't look like they require oxygen. They don't seem to have any sort of lung. They might get their energy from another source, as in Soul Rock and Lunatone get theirs from the sky from the sun and whatever energy the moon's giving it off from where they're at. And Externitus gets it from the sun as well. So as long as it has exposure to that, it's able to survive. These Pokemon are also a good chunk of them being inorganic types. So again, ice and poison and rock aren't exactly organic, but they can be mixed with more organic Pokemon to survive. I think it's fascinating to think of how these aliens got here. Now, as for Starmie and Staryu, Again, they prove that there's water somewhere on that planet. So they prove that the planet is big enough to also have a good chunk of gravity. With Starmie and Staryu, what probably happened was when that impact or whatever hit that planet, it probably knocked a few of them along for the ride. Now, them being based on sea stars and starfish, even though they don't have the ability, they do have the move recover. They don't have the ability to regenerate, but they can constantly be recovering. They don't have a mouth. They don't seem to eat. They probably get most of their energy from moisture. So what if there was a comet or a meteor that was created by them when it was launched off the planet, and then they're inside it? They're tucked away inside this rock to survive. We have found evidence that a good chunk of the Earth's water came from impacts billions of years ago, and that will help create the water cycle. So to wrap it all up in a bow, the planet that these guys are coming from, is going to be a planet very similar to ourselves, but most likely it is barren, it is rocky, there's little to no oxygen. The sun is probably a bit farther away, making it a little bit colder, not able to access as much energy. And it probably has a very similar day or night cycle filled with predators and other things out there that are both eating and being eaten. I want to see more alien Pokemon. I want to see more Pokemon, not just random legendaries that come from space, but I would love to see more Pokemon that are based on, like, alien life. Not just 
Pokemon based on UFOs. We have two of those already. I want to see Pokemon that come from another world because that's something we haven't explored yet. We haven't explored the idea of, wow, what if there's Pokemon in other worlds? We got to other dimensions before we got to outer space. I feel that that is a missed opportunity. Let's send a team of 12-year-olds into space with a Rayquaza and a Deoxys to guide them, and they go out and they explore space. That would be an excellent spin-off adventure. Now, before I wrap up, I do want to let you guys know that in about a week on December 19th, from 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. the following morning, we are going to be part of a group that's hosting a tabletop PvP event. Uh, this is going to be with a bunch of podcasters who are going to be playing against one another, and donors who help out can help impact the outcomes of the matches, as well as some other, let's say, random events. That's always a fun part to do with these things. That being said, we do have about $350 in prizes for this event, so if you love Pokemon merch and random other stuff, Trust me, it's going to be a lot of fun watching a bunch of goons just start yelling at each other over a tabletop. This year has not been great for just about anybody. There have been people who have lost their homes, loved ones, so much that I can't even describe. But our goal is to raise a minimum of $1,000. So if you guys would want to be a part of that, I'll have a link down in the description. You guys can be able to look into that on the Pokecasters Network. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. Have a wonderful day. Live long and prosper. Peace. <laughs>